Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar organized by the IMEC's Biomedical Engineering Division. My name is Alex Dickinson. I'm from the University of Southampton, and I'm, uh, I'm introducing you this, this afternoon. Uh, so we used, as a little history, we used to run um, an alternating orthopedics conference uh, I, each year on either the hip or the knee. Um, until a couple of years ago, we, we realized that we wanted to try and broaden this into a slightly wider range of, of biomechanics topics, generally around orthopedics. And then uh, clearly our event couldn't take place in person last year. We used to have a two day meeting uh, with about 60 people in the audience at Birdcage Walk. Um, but uh, last year we organized uh, an afternoon webinar just like this one. And we found that about four times as many people attended and, uh, and we had some wonderful discussions. So we decided to, to try and do the, the same again this year, even though it was a biannual event. And uh, I'm delighted to say that we've got uh, three very interesting and diverse talks uh, for you. Uh, the theme of the meeting was uh, inspired by where we were at this point last year, um, which was that uh, we'd all had a fairly, fairly tough year and we wanted to share what uh, three leaders in the field were excited about for orthopedics uh, for the coming year. Uh, it seems we're in a, in a slightly similar position, um, but uh, yeah, we, we have three forward-looking um, uh, talks this afternoon, and I'm going to hand over to my co-chair, Diogo Gorelles, who's going to introduce uh, our first speaker for this afternoon. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Diogo Gerardes, and I'm introducing uh, the first speaker for today. Dr. Johan Enkel is a fellow in trauma and orthopedic surgery at the London Implant Retrieval Center and UCL hospitals. I have had the pleasure of experiencing and witnessing firsthand the great work done by both the Implant Retrieval Center and Stanmore Hospital where he works, uh, pushing the, the, the envelope and in developing uh, novel solutions in orthopedics that combine robotics, imaging, 3D printing. So it is, uh, a privilege to be able to share that with the rest of the IMECI community. So I've been asked to say a few words about the work we are doing at the RNOH. I'm a fellow there and I work closely with the clinical team as a surgeon and of course with the engineering team. Um, Prof Hart, Professor Hart leads the team. He is the Professor of Orthopedics at UCL and a surgeon at the RNOH. My two colleagues who are engineers, um, Dr. Anna Di Lara, who works uh, in the Surgical Technology Center, um, help, uh, basically the planning execution of uh, all the technology before the surgery. And Dr. Harry Hothi, um, who sort of does a lot of work looking at retrieved implants and interrogating the implants that have failed. My talk plan today is just to say a bit about this so-called revolution in, in orthopedics with the use of additive manufacturing, um, say a bit about the work we are doing interrogating these implants, um, their application in orthopedics in acetabular reconstruction, and a few case examples. So what's this new revolution? Well, traditionally, um, implants, orthopedic implants, were, were made from forging and casting. And this, this change, this, this, this revolution, this adoption of additive manufacturing is relatively recent. However, there have been uh, implants on the market over the last sort of 10 years. One company manufactured them, bulky 3D printed implants. I think the adoption now is changing to a more customized implants. And just to say a bit about the, the, the market, of course, we know that additive manufacturing is, is, is here. It's big, it's big business. It's a billion pound industry. And all the indications are that it's a, it's, there's one direction, one trajectory, which is upward and a lot more investment in this space. And it's everywhere, it's everywhere. And every item, I think one of the companies I used to sort of work with early on was um, Materialize and they had huge printers in Leuven um, and they would print anything. And I think that move is, is more and more coming into to medicine. So specifically now with regard to orthopedics, what's the rationale? What's the unmet need? Why 3D printing? So I think if you just look at arthroplasty, 
what are the two main challenges? Well, one is the bearing, and I'm going to stay, sort of keep away from that topic at the moment. But of course, material loss at the bearing, um, bearing failure, um, bearing wear over time, fracture of, of ceramic implants, um, wear of the polyethylene, those tend to be the issues around orthopedic arthroplasty as regards wear. But the other big area is, um, is implant loosening. And loosening is associated with two causes. One is aseptic loosening, so non-infection, and of course, septic loosening. And again, I'm gonna stay on the aseptic side. All implants fail, every single implants fail. They are, there's no such thing as in, an inert implant. Um, that's, that's just not the case, no matter the material. And of course, the bone metal interface, it, it's the challenge. It's the big deal to, you know, what are we looking for? We're looking for the everlasting or lifelong hip replacement or knee replacement. And we're miles away from that. So we've turned, industry has turned to 3D printing. We can, we can basically plan anything we want almost and building that structure that we think enhances fixation matches the bone characteristics pore size improves the coefficient of friction so you get a better press fit when you put these implants in initially these are uncemented implants of course a more comparable modulus uh, of elasticity and again trying to optimize ultimately uh, joint biomechanics ensuring that the implant isn't too big We've got to have bone sparing procedures. So I think that's that's the the gist. That's why we are turning to additive manufacturing because it can be more tailored to the patient. So what's the unmet need as regards complex acetabular reconstruction? And that's generally the area that we're applying the technology to. So revision surgery is a big deal. Um, and as hip arthroplasty becomes a lot more mature and more and more patients have had hip replacements over the last 40 years, we're seeing a lot more failure, which is inevitable. As I said before, all implants fail. Some fail at 15 years, some fail at 10 years. And of course, there's early failure. And early failure tends not to be associated with the implant so much, but with more the patient's biology and importantly, the surgeon factors. So specifically about revision surgery, here we have up on the left of the image, um, we see a patient who's had a revised hip on the left side, so that the side that we can see the implant migrating into the, the pelvis. And this patient's had a cage, a, a, a cage, this is a, a conventionally manufactured implant, and it's the one size fits all sort of thing in that we have to fit the patient to the implant. And that's a big deal because they fail, and they fail in two, three years, and uh, sometimes earlier. And this patient will then move on to have revision surgery upon revision surgery upon revision surgery. And the morbidity associated with that, the pain associated with that, is huge. And of course, the risk of infection, because every time you operate on a patient, you increase the risks of infection, because this is a foreign body in the patient, and it's very easy for that to become infected. So infection risk, I think, for primary arthroplasty is under 1%. And in some of these cases, it's up to 5 6 7%. Uh, uh, infection rate. And there you see in the bottom right, there is a, an implant that's made to fit the patient. So here we have implant fitting the patient now, and hence we're getting, we think, uh, better stability, a better fit. A bit about the trajectory for uh, the use of these implants. I think in two, about 2007, there are only about six available designs on the market. So there was a very sort of slow adoption, and rightly so. Over the last few years, I think we're up to about 25 different um, designs or manufacturers, um, brands of 3D printed cups. And the trajectory is, is one way, just one way at the moment. Additive manufacturing at the moment in all of orthopedics um, implants is about 1.2 billion pounds. But it's projected uh, to go up to twice, three times that over the next few years. So what are we doing at Stanmore? Um, we're beginning to adopt these implants, but of course, as a responsible uh, institution, I think we have to interrogate them a lot more. So here is a 3D printed implant, off the shelf, so it's not customized, off the shelf implant, 3D printed. And this, we are using basic engineering tools, of course, to, to, to interrogate the implant. Can we 
can we manufacture implants that are comparable to a conventional implant? And here we are using a CMM to just interrogate the internal um, diameter till surface uh, of the implant. And of course, this area is basically the liner sits within this space. And if it's not round, or if it doesn't conform to the liner, then if you put a ceramic liner in, there's a chance of fracture. However, we see no great difference between what's manufactured here, because a lot of this is post-processed um, to grind the surface to fit. The, so we see no issues on, on the inner side of the shell. We then moved on to use sort of SEM to interrogate uh, these, these implants. And what we began to see were these partially molten particles sitting on the edges of these implants on the sort of the bone uh, interface side. And there were these little beads about 20 microns in size, up to 40 microns in size. And the concern was, well, do these things come loose in the patient? And the bottom images show a conventional implant. And these are implants in which titanium beads are, are sprayed onto uh, the implant. It's a conventional process and it's post-process. And we do not see that under SEM imaging. Further interrogation of these implants, uh, as we know, SC, uh, additive manufacturing is layer by layer, um, layer on layer. And we can see this on the SEM. And so the concern here also is will there be delamination because in other materials um, used in completely other sectors, delamination is a problem with these implants. And we published in this space. Um, so far, we haven't seen that clinically and on retrieved implants, but these looking at pristine implants, we can see this feature. The other aspect we again went on to use was the other tool was micro CT um, to look at these, at these pores, to look at the, the 3D structure to look at the porous structure um, and the regularity or irregularity of these of these of these implants and of course a lot of this is dependent on the printer and so the quality of the print so there's of course the cad the cad file what's sent to the printer what's printed and of course what's delivered to us and so again we were using micro ct to look at these implants and what we found interestingly there are these pores within the 3D structure, within not the porous sector, but the solid part, the part that holds the, the, the shell or the liner. And we can see these porosities um, in, in the metal up to 20 microns. And again, what does it mean? Um, wh what, can we, what can we take away from that? And are there any safety issues? We are using this in our group for acetabular shells, so for the acetabular implant that holds the liner um, for hip replacement. So the risk of break, breakage or fracture or failure of these cuffs, I think it's theoretical because we haven't seen it. And we've been using some of these implants over uh, 10 years, and this is the early batch. We haven't seen a problem, but I think one of the things we've noticed is that these implants are quite thick. So they have been quite over-engineered. They're bigger than conventional implants and they're thicker. And the course, the trade-off there is bone loss or loss of bone stock in trying to fit these, these implants in. So in transitioning to these implants, um, the big issue is patient safety. We've had the fiasco with metal on metal and the sequelae is, is, is still unfinished. Uh, about 50% of patients that had metal or metal hips are revised, but there are another 50% of patients out there, still thousands of patients with metal or metal hips. Now, the advocates for metal or metal are, are still there, um, the advocate, and surgeons are still inserting them, and they work. They do work, but we are finding longer-term problems associated with, with metal or metal hips. The concerns for us now as regards um, these implants are, is there a material loss from the bone interface um, with these implants? Is there going to be a problem with blood titanium? Are there going to be systemic effects, local effects associated with this? Do these beads mean anything? Is there a risk of a delamination of these implants? So we've done a bit of work looking at um, blood tests looking at uh, blood titanium levels. Um, we had done some pioneering work for metal on metal looking at cobalt and chrome. And we found out from cobalt and chrome work from those metal on metal implants 
that two parts per billion, two to four parts per billion was a relatively safe level um, for these metals in the blood. For titanium, our work looking at conventional implants and uh, over the last few years, we've seen again a safe limit. Well, I shouldn't say safe, but a finding, common finding is that a well functioning implant is about below, you find about below four parts per billion. However, with these larger implants, these custom implants, these bulky implants, we're seeing up tenfold increases in, in parts per billion. And again, there's not a lot of data on toxicity of titanium. What does it mean? I think time will tell, but close follow-up of these patients is essential. So we have been applying this technique for acetabular reconstruction. And failure in acetabular, in hip failure, and in particularly in the acetabulum, is increasing because more and more surgeries, and of course, more and more revision surgeries, and more and more second, third, and fourth time surgery. So I have here increased uh, propensity of sort of proposky type defects, and it's just a classification system for the size of the defect. And as these defects get bigger, the challenges for reconstruction are huge. And for many of these patients that come to Stanmore, they come to us as the last port of call. If we are unable to do anything with these patients to reconstruct them, well, they'd never walk again. And there are a number of cases that we have, we cannot help them. The, the, the defect is so large um, and they may have other comorbidities, they may have long-standing infection, which you cannot eradicate. And so we, we are able to help a lot more people to get them walking again, but there are a certain number that we can't because the defect's too large. But we are finding more and more that we are able to print implants that can fit the defect. However, they may not be, we may not be able to put them in surgically. There are nerves and blood vessels in the way. So yes, theoretically, we can design an implant to fit, but can we put it in surgically? And that, that's also the other challenge. A bit about the workflow in, in the lead up to the surgery. We need to image these patients, so we use CT imaging. The big issue with CT imaging is the fact that you get these metal artifacts. So it's really hard to understand, characterize the defect. So that's challenge number one. Can you create a virtual model to plan the surgery that's representative of the defect? So that's a huge problem. And metal artifact reduction sequences are in its infancy. Um, and we are having challenges with that. There are times we go into the to do the operation, the implant isn't quite right. So we have again to go back to fitting the patient to the implant. And of course, the rational here is to do the opposite. So the first step is hello. The first step is uh, so some noise on the line. The first step is to basically get the implant um, well designed and then get it into the patient ensure that the design is able to meet the, the orientation that's needed to accommodate the femoral side of the implant. Of course, we've got to think about the bone, the bone, the nature of the bone. A lot of the bone here is dead bone. Yeah. Or, and so there are two things here. There's biological fixation and there's mechanical fixation. So again, it's a trade-off. Um, and how do we design an implant to fit that patient? And of course, you know, getting that implant in, getting into the right position, again, the next challenge. We've had to uh, even get to a point where we've had to do two-stage surgery. So a patient comes in, they need a hip replacement. The imaging is poor. We can't, we can't get sufficient information about the defect. So we have to do two-stage surgery, which is the patient comes in, all the metal work's taken out. They have a CT scan. Um, the data is then sent to the company. Um, they then segment and design the implant, and that's taking up to six to eight weeks. So we've got a patient here without an implant, can't walk, sometimes can't stand, um, waiting for an implant to be designed to fit them. And so we've actually had to do a study looking at this two-stage surgery versus single-stage surgery. And we've found that, of course, the design improves, but what about the comorbidity to the patient? So again, that trade-off needs to be, you know, needs to be, considered. Other big issue we have is also, of course, 
functional imaging. Many of these patients, the anatomy is twisted. You see the image here. This patient's had multiple hip replacements. So the pelvis, the relationship between the spine, the pelvis, and the lower limbs, completely distorted. And of course, we haven't got standing CT. You know, sort of, there's no standing 3D modality. So we've gone to use the sort of uh, biplanar imaging, and which we co-register the biplanar imaging to the CT to give us a clear understanding about the pelvic orientation and the spinopelvic relationship. What about the outcome from our study? So we've got uh, we've got a study ongoing. I think we've used about 50 of these implants. Um, we did study looking at 20 of them, looking at sort of medium term outcome. And a number of things we're looking, have we delivered the plan? Is the implant in position? Have they failed? What are the issues? What are the scores? Are these patients walking again? And it's, it's, it's quite a challenge to, to, to get these patients walking again, to get their confidence up and truly to evaluate their pain. Radiographically, of course, we can look at outcome. We can look at the planned position and the achieved position, and we can see, well, we've got the implant into where we think it should be. But what about the function for the patient uh, in it? Um, can the rest of their pelvis accommodate what we put in? And that's also a challenge. So I'll just run through a few case examples. We've got a few more minutes. Um, so here's a patient, 57-year-old, um, multiple surgeries. Uh, you can see the position of the implant on, on, the, on the right side of the patient, which is the left side of the picture. And that ball has eroded all the way up into the, the top of the innominate bone or the ileum. And that, that's a failed implant. That patient is struggling to walk. Of course, the implant's still in, so the leg is still articulating with the pelvis. So at least they are in one piece, but they're in a lot of pain. And just of interest, you look on the other side, you can see the hips in, but it's wearing. You can see eccentric wear. You can see the ball is no longer in the center of the cup, and that's polyethylene wear. So this patient's got a failed implant on one side and a failing implant on the other. So we've got a CT scan of the patient. Um, we, we looked at the, the migration of the center of rotation. That's the defect from a segmented CT scan. And there is a planned implant. So yes, it fits, but can we surgically get that implant in? And that's the surgical challenge. So we get these models. We, we, we evaluate them. We think about the surgical access, the surgical approach. And another example here, um, this is a patient that's had a reconstruction. We got the leg lens right. You see the size of the defect. And this patient is in the gym, is, is walking again. Um, so the burden to the state of looking after this patient, the carers for this patient, this patient's up, walking again. However, this is their last chance. That fails. There's a lot, not a lot more that can be done. Another case example, 64-year-old male, um, failed implant, fractured implant, comes to us, last resort, um, he's 64. Can he walk again? A number of other surgeons have tried, and they've done it as best they can to get him walking. And here he is, um, you can see the defect in his knee, his, his whole posture is changed. He's got what looks like a sort of a valgus deformity of the knee. It isn't really just the knee. It's the fact that his pelvis has been wrong for such a long time. And to get him to stand again, to get him to walk again, is a challenge. So the, the corollary of all of this is that the surgeon, we could plan the implant, design the implant, print the implant, get it in. But can the patient walk? And the other 50%, of course, is the rehabilitation of, of that patient. And this is some newer work that we've been doing uh, using, again, 3D printing. So this is a patient with a metal metal hip. We can see the osteolysis. So this patient has never had a revision. This is first case surgery. So we're, we're, this is the first revision. And you can see the large defects, osteolytic defects in, in the bone just above the cup, the weight-bearing region of the cup. And so we've decided to sort of evaluate, can we print implants using con the conventional cup uh, design, but org bends onto the cup that can fit these defects. So again, smaller implants, less costly, less burdensome, less risk, less surface area, but can still fit the patient. And we've done a few cases of these, and from a radiographic perspective, they work. 
from a functional perspective in the short term that patients are pain-free, leg lengths are equal, and they're able to wait there. So, in summary, where are we going with this? Well, I think there's a potential to, to help patients walk again, to be pain-free. Close patient follow-up is essential. It's really crucial. Enhanced post-market surveillance is, is what we're doing with industry. We've got to bear in mind the, the, the fiascos in the past. Orthopedic surgeons and industry have made significant errors in the past and have, have really damaged patients as opposed to help them. The metal to metal saga is, is a good one. Good example. We need better surgical tools to get these implants in and hence we can better design these implants. To get a customized implant with an irregular uh, backside, regular contact to the patient, how can we sort of, uh, how can we prepare the bone? Currently the tools that we use are hemispherical reamers. So I think with better tools will come better designs and the tools will involve patient-specific instrumentation, uh, computer-assisted surgery, robots, navigation system, and uh, these will help the design. We need better imaging. We need to have uh, better ways to image the patient preoperatively, uh, better ways to appreciate the bony defect. The other issue is understanding the, the, the quality of the bone with the metal artifact, getting any information on the bone, the Hans field, uh, the grayscale, even anything about the bone is difficult. Ret retrieval studies are essential. We are doing that at Stanmore, evaluating all of the failed implants, both 3D printed and non. And finally, I think time will tell. Time will tell whether this technology would be more widely adopted. Of course, cost is a factor. And as more and more patients need surgery, if we can customize the implants and reduce the inventory needed to size a, an implant for, for patients at surgery, that'll be a, a big bonus also. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johan, for such a, a great talk highlighting that the safety and performance of orthopedic implants is in fact multifactorial. Having designed custom implants myself in the past, I always found there's a, a fine line between, or if, uh, it's hard to balance sometimes innovation and safety. Uh, and I'd like to see uh, or uh, ask you, how do you, do you find that you can uh, apply the state-of-the-art technologies in 3D printing, processing, uh, imaging, uh, robotics, whilst ensuring that devices are safe. Because yeah. of orthopedic implants, the, the feedback loop is quite long. Yeah, I, I'll be right. I mean, I think for the tooling, for the tooling, uh, that's a little, so the robots and navigation systems, you can use a radiological um, techniques post-op to, to see have you, have you built as you planned. I think you're right for the implants, longer term, longer term works needed and longer term follow up, post market surveillance, you know, five, 10 years. And I think we've got to do it very carefully. We've got to, mo so what we do, we monitor uh, blood titanium levels. So six monthly blood titanium levels. CT scans we do yearly. We do x rays every six months. Um, so we spend a lot of time monitoring each patient. We've done a series of about 50 and we are studying them as, as, as we go. So no one is discharged and everyone is followed up and we will do this, you know, to 10 years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just want to know, I think you're still sharing uh, your screen, so we happy for you to switch off. Uh, we have some questions from the public. Uh, so the first one is about surface preparation for implants. What kind of surface pre preparations do you see uh, often, I imagine, in the, uh, the osseointegration side of the implants? Um, so, I mean, again, porosity, um, strut size, these are all issues as regards the design of the implant. So the challenges here are, can we standardize um, a print that fits the patient as regards the pore size or strut size? And that's a challenge. A lot of the bone's dead. In many cases, the bone's dead as in not biologically active. And every patient is different. At the moment, we're not customizing that, that print, that mesh that we're not we're using standard a standard print that's designed by industry that's apparently optimized to, to a patient. So it's a one size fits all as regards the mesh. Um, as regards, um, so to answer the question, it's difficult. I think it's early days. 
um, it's working for, so to give you an example, from our series, we've had two failures. And again, what does failure mean? So we've had two cases where patients have become infected. So they had previous infection, long-term infection. We thought it was eradicated, implants in, and they've failed. So we've had to take them out and there's nothing more to be done at the moment because putting anything back in, they again become infected. For the other 48 patients, we've had no early failure. So it's working. So whatever we're doing, it's working. Do we know why? Do we have the evidence to defend it fully? No, it's an experiment. To be honest, it's an experiment. But if you consent the patient right, if you explain to them the risks, um, and if you liaise closely with industry um, as to what are they doing, so the surgeon knows exactly what he's doing, what he's putting in, he or her is putting in, then yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. And I have a few more questions. I'm going to bundle these up together. One is about the role for biomechanics for custom implants. Uh, if you think there's a role for it in, in order to predict functional outcome, for instance, in musculoskeletal modeling, but also in final element analysis to investigate the structural integrity of the implant. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, both are absolutely right. So we've been, we've been trying to do some work with FE in, in this space. So, I mean, most companies have their own model. So they have a model and they put their implant design through that model. And a lot of it, there's a lot of IP associated with that. Um, and it, what's interesting is that they do this and they say, well, you know, we've planned this implant. It's going to fit. It's supposed to fit in that position. But we seldom ever achieve that position. So biomechanically, we're not putting it in as planned because we haven't got the tools to do it. It's a huge defect. You go in surgically. There's a lot of scar tissue, a lot of dead bone. Um, it's really hard to seat this implant in the position it was designed. So... So we've got something that's built to fit biomechanically in a certain way, and yet we're not achieving that. So we're doing some work now with one of the companies, doing some FE on the achieved position. So yes, so now the orientation, the position, X, Y, Z, um, translation, orientation, um, does that new construct match what was designed? So again, crucial. Yes, so agree. Okay, and then... Um... I uh, have a couple more questions. I think I'm gonna, I am will bundle them up as well and then move on to the next presenter. So one is about like, you've shown uh, obviously applications for hip replacements, but uh, in particular the acetabular reconstruction side, but do you see uh, 3D printed, you know, also femurs and other joints? And uh, if there's any scope for alternative printed uh, materials, for example, PEAK? Yes, uh, interesting. So yes, yeah, so I think we're, we're using them for knees. So I think at this stage, we're using it more for reconstruction. So failed, so failed surgery, third, fourth time surgery, so revision surgery. And yes, um, customized implants for the knee and for the shoulder are being used. They are off the shelf implants now for spine. So there are a lot of 3D implants for the spine and that's also being introduced um, cautiously. So yes, so there's a role for the other joints, definitely. And there was one more question you had. It's about biomaterials, if there's... Uh... Oh, yeah, peak. So, yeah, um, again, we've had some problems with peak. Yeah. Um, we've had a, a huge a huge fiasco, a failure uh, with peak um, in another joint. And, um, yes, amazingly, again, as I say, none of these things are inert. So, theoretically, yes, but uh, material-wise, um, toxicity-wise, yeah, questions still, still remain. Thank you very much for your time. I think it's time to move on to the next speaker, but uh, I appreciate your time and sharing it with us, the set of the technology at UCH. Thank you so much. Much obliged. Cheers. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Johan and, and Diogo. Um, now, uh, many of you have found the uh, the question and answer panel in the in, in the discussions. Uh, so if we don't quite get a chance to to get to your question during the uh, the discussion. Uh, the speakers do have the opportunity to reply by text afterwards, although we understand that Dr. Henkel has to uh, to dash back to his, to his patients. Um, but uh, please do carry on asking questions for the next two speakers. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that we were keen to try and uh, uh, expand the scope of this meeting beyond just the hip and the knee. So I'm delighted that uh, this year we have a speaker on the spine for the first time. Dr. Jude Meakin is a senior lecturer from uh, the Biomedical Physics and Biomedical Engineering Department at the University of Exeter. Uh, she's going to. She she is uh, quite an expert in uh, the the variability of the positioning of the spine, and is interesting whether this is uh, a postural or or a functional anatomic um, phenomenon. Uh, 
when I mentioned we were using this uh, this meeting as much to talk about what we're excited about, um, Jude and her team have recently had an EPSRC grant uh, awarded, uh, image-driven subject-specific spine models, which I believe she may be about to, to tell us a bit about. So uh, Jude, as soon as you're ready, please, uh, please go ahead and share your screen and uh, tell us about uh, your project. Okay. Um, thank you very much. So I think I'm ready to go. Just stop me if you can't see the slides or anything. So hello and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be joining you today to talk about the work that Alex mentioned, where we're using medical imaging to understand more about the human spine. And in particular, trying to use imaging to help us assess the loads that the spine experiences in everyday life. So I'm sure that many of you know that our spines are quite a complicated structure that consists of a large number of bones that are held together by joints and ligaments and supported and controlled by quite a complicated network of muscles. And it's this arrangement of the bones, joints and muscles that allows our spine to combine quite a substantial amount of flexibility with enough strength to keep our bodies upright and also to allow us to pick up additional weights. But when we adopt these different postures and perform activities such as lifting, our spines are going to experience quite a wide range of different forces or loads. And being able to assess these loads, particularly in vivo, is really important to help us understand how the healthy spine works, what activities might lead to the spine becoming injured or degenerated, how different spinal disorders might affect the spine, and also to help us to design effective preventative measures or treatments for people who are suffering from spinal disorders. So if understanding loads in the spine is so important, how can we do it? Well, one option is that we could measure the spinal loads using probes such as the one you can see in this top left image. And this can be inserted into the discs between the spine to measure the pressure that the discs are experiencing. And over the past several decades, a number of studies have done this and demonstrated that the loads on our spine differ across different postures. So if like me, you're currently sitting down, then we'd expect that the pressure in your discs is currently around about 0.5 megapascals, so about, um, about uh, five atmospheres. But if, for example, you're taking advantage of the recent work at home advice and you're having a little lie down while you listen in, then you'd expect the pressure to be much less at about 0.1. Alternatively, um, if you started to do some uh, bending over or doing some lifting, then the pressures in your disc will rise to several megapascals. Now, measuring the loads in the spine like this uh, is very useful to give us information, but it's, as you can imagine, quite invasive, which limits the use of these methods. Another disadvantage is it can only really tell us about what's happening in one disc of the spine at one time. And that makes modeling a really attractive alternative for assessing loads in the spine in vivo, because as well as being much more acceptable to participants, it also allows us to investigate how loads vary within the different parts of the spine. Now, again, over the last 50, 70 years or so, there's been a whole variety of different modeling strategies that have been used, a few of which are shown here, although there's many, many more, which have been developed for assessing loads in the spine. And these have also told us a lot of useful things about how the spine works and how the load will change in different postures and different activities. Now, one of the really exciting developments of modeling is that particularly as imaging and computing increases, it opens up the ability to investigate loads on an individual or a subject specific uh, basis. And I think this is really important given the fact that uh, there's a very wide variation that we know exists between us. So if, for example, I could look at the spines of everyone in the audience here, we'll, what we would see is that there's differences in your spinal anatomy. And we can see that in these MR pictures of the lumbar spine, which show quite significant variation in the curvature and distribution of the curvature. We'd also see differences in the capacity of your muscles, differences in the stiffness of your tissues, and probably differences in the way you control your spine to perform a given task, such as lifting an object from the floor. And we can see this effect of this variation in all these different parameters in measurements of disc pressure. 
As you can see on this plot from another group, Sato et al. from 1999, who looked at uh, disc pressures in a variety of postures. Here I'm showing the data just for standing for eight or nine healthy people. And this shows that even in one posture, across different people, our discs are going to experience a wide range of different loading scenarios. So if we want to use a model to understand loading in the spine, then capturing this variability is really an essential aspect. But achieving this across all these different parameters really can be quite a challenge. And that's where our recent work has been looking at how imaging can help us by allowing us to capture information on the anatomy, motion and tissues of an individual person so that we can generate a fully subject specific model to tell us about spinal loading. So I'm going to talk in a short while about our new EPSRC funded project where we hope to fully develop our methods for achieving uh, this type of modeling. But first I'm going to sort of set the scene a little bit by talking about two pilot projects that led us to this point. So our first pilot project involved using magnetic resonance images and our aim was to investigate how loads in the disc change when people adopt different everyday postures. And the basic concept of this project uh, and much of our work is that we would use a magnetic resonance image of a person's spine in an unloaded posture so that we could get their anatomy and then obtain another image in a loaded posture to determine how the spine deformed, how the vertebra moved as they change posture and use these two bits of information in a model to estimate what the loading was on their spine. So to achieve this, we used some data from nine individuals that had already been acquired by Hirasawa in 2007. And in their study, they'd been able to acquire images of the participants lying down in the supine posture. And because they had access to a particular type of magnetic resonance imager, they were able to also acquire images of the participants in the standing and sitting posture. So as I mentioned, we we're going to use the images obtained in the supine posture lying down to create the geometry of the model, which you can see here on the right. Now in this model, you can see that it's two dimensional and the vertebral bodies here are considered as being rigid and the discs, um, which we included both a nucleus in light blue and the annulus in dark blue, with given properties from the literature. So these are not subject specific. So to determine the deformation of the spine as it moved from lying down to another posture, for example, sitting, we used a series of points that we manually placed around the outside of the vertebral body. So you can see these green points on the images. And we use these to determine both the translation and rotation of each individual vertebra in the spine. So you can see an example here for one particular vertebra, where by looking at the mean position of the points, we could calculate the translation in the horizontal and vertical direction. And then by using a technique called singular value decomposition, we were able to capture the rotation of these points. So this was repeated across all nine participants, giving the data that you can see here. So here we have plots showing the calculated translation in the horizontal direction, translation in the vertical direction, and also rotation of each of the vertebra from S1 to L1, first of all, for the nine participants moving from supine to standing and then going from supine to sitting. And I think I really wanted to highlight this data because, again, it demonstrates what I mentioned at the start of the talk in that the way people control their spines when they're doing an activity or when they're changing their posture really varies quite considerably. So the values that you see here were applied to the subject specific models we've made. And that allowed us to determine the pressure within the discs uh, as shown in this example for just one participant. And you can see, uh, we're seeing the pore pressure in each of the discs and we can see some variation along the spine and also within the discs uh, at a given level in the spine. Now to assess whether these values were in any way reasonable in this pilot project, we focused just on one disc, which is the L4, L5 disc, near the lower part of the spine as shown here. So looking at the pressures that the model had predicted in standing and sitting for the nine participants, I was quite excited to see that there was some variation in the predicted values and also variation in whether the pressure increased or decreased as the participants uh, went from one posture to the other. 
However, perhaps slightly less exciting is that when we compared the values to the results from Sato et al, so some experimental results in the literature, you can see that although we've got similar trends to what we would expect to see from experimental results, the values that our model predicting were quite substantially higher than we would expect to see in reality. Now, there's probably several reasons for this, but one of the main reasons we believe is that we were using a 2D model. And so that led then to our second pilot project, which uh, was performed in collaboration with the AECC University College in Bournemouth and used funding from the Chiropractic Research Council. So the overall concept of this project was essentially the same as in our first pilot, but this time we aim to um, uh, get over the limitation of using a 2D model by creating 3D models and also try to much more capture the dynamic motion of the vertebra using a technique called fluoroscopy. So to create our subject specific models, we again obtained magnetic resonance images from the participants lying down, but this time with slightly higher resolution, which enable us to create uh, a full three-dimensional model. Although again, uh, although as you can see in this image, we're focusing on a slightly smaller section of the lumbar spine in this pilot project. Now, again, we used um, rigid vertebral bodies and we assigned disc properties from the literature. So to determine the motion of the spine, as I said, we introduced a new technique in the second pilot called fluoroscopy. Now, if you're not familiar with this imaging method, fluoroscopy is essentially a series of X-ray images that are taken continuously over a period of time. Now, here on the left, you can see the fluoroscopy setup from the AECC, which allowed us to then capture images um, of the participants that we involved in the study, such as this one here, which shows one of our participants starting in an upright standing position and then flexing until they'd achieved a trunk flexion of around about 60 degrees. And then you can see them returning back up to the upright position. So each of the participants performed a trunk flexion to 60 degrees, and then they also performed a 20 degree trunk extension. Now, Although we had full motion data, um, and we actually are only able to look at the endpoints within our model within this pilot. But the process for determining the motion of the vertebra as the participants chain position was exactly the same as before, in that we mapped the vertebra between the supine MRI and the upright fluoroscopy images, and then the fully flex and the fully extended images, so that we could calculate the translation rotation of each of the vertebral bodies within the spine. So I'm not gonna present all the results from this second pilot project, but perhaps what is the key result um, that we obtained from this was that by moving to a 3D model, we were able to obtain compressive stresses uh, in the L4-5 disc again, which in this model is the lower, the lowest of the two discs that we're modeling. And the good thing that we could see here was that by moving to a three-dimensional model, you can now see that the model is predicting or was predicting disc pressures and stresses, which are much more consistent to the values that we would expect from experimental measures. You can also see that um, the results from the model follow the trends that we would expect in terms of the experimental results, where participants that move into the extension experience a slight increase in the pressures in this L4-5 disc. Whereas when they go into 60 degrees of flexion, the pressure increases much more compared to the upright posture. So having demonstrated the feasibility of using medical imaging technology to capture information on the anatomy, the motion, and using this information in a model to assess load in the spine, we're now, um, as Alex mentioned, now going to start a new project where we're really going to think about how we can refine our methods for capturing this anatomy in motion and address a key challenge that so far in our pilot work we've ignored, which is to include subject specific tissues. So in terms of capturing anatomy, we're pretty much going to follow our previous approach of using magnetic resonance imaging to create three-dimensional models. 
Now, I have to admit, I'm cheating slightly by showing this picture on the right, as this has been created from CT data rather than MR data. However, we hope that with access to 3T magnetic resonance equipment, we should be able to acquire images that allow us to produce much higher quality models than we have before, allowing us potentially to produce uh, the geometry of our models similar to that shown here. Now, why we need to do this is that by having higher quality models with much more precise geometry, we hope that we should not only be able to look at the loads that are present in the discs of the spine within our participants, but also look at the loads in the facet joints in the posterior elements of the spine. And this is actually a really important aspect for understanding loading, uh, understanding the loads that are present in a healthy spine, and also understanding how loads change when, for example, the discs become degenerate. Now, to capture the vertebral motion, we're again, as we did in our second pilot, going to use fluoroscopy. But this time, rather than just capturing the motion of the vertebra um, in the frontal plane, so as people flex and extend, we're going to capture the full three-dimensional motion of the vertebra. And this means that we're going to be able to look at a much wider range of postures and activities, including things such as lateral bending. Now to do this, we're going to be collaborating with Cardiff, working at the Cardiff Musculoskeletal Biomechanics Research Facility. And this facility houses their bespoke high-speed dynamic biplane x-ray machine, which you can see in this picture here. Now, if I just start the video. Oh, hang on one second. OK, there we go. So here in this video, you can see David, um, who's demonstrating the ability to move the X-ray equipment around so that the two X-ray, um, the two X-ray generators and detectors can be manipulated into any position required. So uh, just to point out, so here on the left, we have the two, uh, well, they keep moving around, but at this point there on the left, we have the two X-ray generators that are going to produce the X-rays. And then on the right at the moment, we have the two detectors that will collect the images. Now, although we don't uh, have all the details exactly how we're going to collect the images at the moment, we envisage that we're probably going to place them in a position such as shown in this image on the right where you can see that we plan to acquire one image uh, looking laterally through the spine, so looking at what happens from the side, and then placing another uh, generator and detector so that we're capturing what happens to the spine, slightly a sort of anterior, posterior view, but probably looking slightly upwards or downwards, whichever way you think about it. Now, because we need to wait for ethical approval before we can actually acquire some images, I don't have any images of the spine to show you. So I'm going to illustrate how we'll use this data by showing you an example from Cardiff of a knee joint. I'm afraid you're gonna to have to pretend that this isn't a knee, that it's actually a spine. So in this image, you can see a participant uh, on the top left here who's being imaged as they walk through the area. And at the point that we're viewing them, you can see that they have their left leg uh, their left foot is just making contact with a force plate and the two x-ray systems are set up so that their knee, uh, an image of their knee, is being captured from two slightly different angles. So if I show you the video of what the two x-ray cameras are seeing, so each one, the left and the right image, each one of those is what the x-ray detector is seeing from these two different angle detectors. Now it's a little bit difficult to see the differences, but if I pause the video at this point, you can see there's a slight difference in what we're seeing, that we're seeing two different views of the knee as the participant walks through the X-ray area. So how can we use these two images to get the motion data? Well, using C-Motion uh, software combined with the three-dimensional models that we'll be obtaining from the magnetic resonance imaging, we can use these two um, slightly different angled X-ray views 
to determine both the position and orientation of each of the bones that we're looking at. So in this example, a femur, but in our project, it'll be the vertebra. Uh, and we can monitor that position and orientation throughout the motion that we're capturing and use this to calculate both the translation and rotation that we then apply to our models. So as I mentioned, something that we've ignored in our pilot work so far, but is actually really important, is the subject specific tissue properties. Now, very few models have attempted, uh, very few models of the spine have attempted to consider tissue properties, or at least consider subject specific tissue properties. But it's particularly important for the type of modeling methods that we're using in our projects, where we're determining the loads by observing the vertical motion. Now, this is again where we hope that taking an imaging approach can help us in that we believe by obtaining some MR information about the tissues, we should be able to infer something about the material properties of those tissues. So to explain how we might do this, as you're probably aware, when we look at images of the body using MR, what we see depends on how those images were taken. So I'm showing an example here of an image acquired of the same person, the same spine on the same day using the same imager. But in the first image on the left, you can see that the discs here look very dark, whereas on the right, they look very bright. And the reason for the difference in how these two images look relates to the first of them on the left being obtained in a way that really brings out the differences in something called the T1 relaxation time, whereas the second highlights differences in something called the T2 relaxation time. Now, if you're not familiar with these terms, then don't worry. The really main point that I'm making is that there are parameters, uh, including these relaxation times, plus a number of other parameters, including something called magnetization transfer ratio, apparent diffusion coefficient, and fractional anisotropy, that are dependent on both the composition and structure of a tissue that's being imaged. And these parameters can be quantified. So to give you an example, I'm showing here an image from a paper from a group in the University of California that's looked at the T1 row relaxation time of the discs in the spine. And in the first image on the left, you can see the, a map of the T1 row values in the spine from somebody who has healthy discs, and you can see the T1 row values are quite high. In the middle, we have somebody whose upper discs are healthy, but the bottom two discs are, uh, have become degenerate and the T1 row values have dropped. And then finally, in the third picture, all the discs in this person's spine have unfortunately become degenerate. Now, although this example and the paper that it comes from is really focusing on the clinical application of detecting disc degeneration, there is evidence from other studies that parameters such as T1 row and the other parameters I mentioned can be used to predict tissue mechanical properties. And learning how we use these parameters, these MR parameters to define our subject specific properties is something that's gonna form a really large piece of work in our project involving a combination of mechanical testing of in vitro specimens, some imaging and some modeling to find out how to make this link between imaging tissues and determining their mechanical properties. Okay, so at the start of this talk, I said that assessing loads in the spine is really important. And I also outlined why, if we're going to use a model to assess spinal loading, we need to take a subject specific approach to capture the substantial variation between us. I hope that over the last 20 minutes or so, I've managed to persuade you that perhaps imaging has a, a useful potential role to help us acquire the information we need on anatomy, motions and tissues that can be used to generate subject specific models and that these could be used to help us assess spinal loads in vivo, and that this has a number of applications in orthopedics. So I'd like to thank you for listening, happy to take questions, but I'd like to acknowledge all the other people from, um, all the rest of the team from Cardiff and Exeter involved in the current project, and a number of other people uh, who've been involved in the previous pilot projects. Brilliant talk. Thank you very much indeed, Jude. That was that was fantastic. Um, so we have a we have one question from from the audience that I think came in relatively early, but has been answered in uh, to some extent. So I'll I'll adjust it slightly. This was from David. Um, so uh, 
I imagine you were restricted to initially comparing your models, your 2D models um, predictions to the experimental data because the experimental data is effectively averaged. Um, but I suppose this now means with your 3D models, you're going to be able to find out much, much more about the spatially varying loading patterns and, and I suppose failure mechanisms in, in terms of uh, disk degeneration. Is that something that you plan to to look at, or is that is that really just the applications of, of what you're what you're building? Yeah, well, I think if I've interpreted the question correctly, I think it, it's sort of around validation in a way. So with we were using real participants. As I said, it's quite difficult to start shoving. It's not really a good idea to shove probes into people. There's more evidence that actually it could cause problems <coughs> down the line. So we weren't able to really do a proper validation. It is comparing to, you know, how do we expect things to be? So something I haven't really covered it in this talk, but another really key aspect of the project we're about to start is to do some robust validation. And what we're really going to do um, is actually start with an in vitro approach so that we can take some in vitro specimens. There will be a mix of animal and human so that we can get a good breadth of different types of discs. And using six axis testing, we're going to move the disc around in lots of different postures, look at the loading that's generated, measure the pressures in the disc, hopefully measure pressures in the facet joint as well, so that we can really fully validate what we're getting from our models, how well is it um, predicting, how well are the models actually predicting the reality. Excellent, thank you. That sounds, sounds good. And uh, you, you sort of mentioned on, on the, the third dimension, so is you're, you're viewing from a couple of, um, uh, well, started on a coronal view. Is there any function of the, the axial view? So I know certainly when, when, when you start looking at things like scoliosis that uh, um, you, you've mentioned in past work, um, it's the axial view where, where, where you may not, uh, which might often be forgotten in the clinical community. So is that something that you might be able to detect? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think it's difficult to pin down exactly what we'll be able to, to detect until we start doing the experiments. But based on other people's work, um, I would expect that we should, from these biplane of views, we should be able to get an idea, not just of the um, the motion within, as you say, the sagittal plane, coronal plane, but also detect whether there's been any uh, rotation as well. And we would expect to see, for example, when you bend to the side, for example, you often get a coupled motion where the vertebra start to twist as well. So we would hope to be able to detect that even in healthy people. Now, you're right, there could be some applications then in looking at people with spines that don't conform to that uh, nominally straight within the sagittal plane, such as scoliosis, whether that's in adolescence or whether that's degenerative. And that could be an exciting future application. That's great, thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna hog the questions because there aren't any more from the floor unless my co-chairs had anything they wanted to ask um, or, or, or the other speakers. Uh, but I was, uh, just as a final question, I was very interested to see the T1 row um, scanning was given, at least allowing you to distinguish between degenerated and, and healthy discs. Do you think that's an indication of a material property change or, or is it almost like uh, strain whitening in, in polymers under loading? Or is it, do, you, do you have a feeling about what, uh, what the mechanism for that might be? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, with all these MR parameters, it's not always 100% or, or there isn't necessarily one single thing that they relate to. But, um, and, and many of the things like the T2, so the example images I showed, um, where you see T1, T2 differences, that's much more related to the water, so the amount of water in the tissue, and also the state of the water. And by that, I mean how much of the water is close to and bound to a polymer, such as the protoglycan, and how much of it can be considered as free. Now, with the T1 row, this is a slightly newer technique. Um, I say newer compared to looking at T1 and T2, but my understanding is that experiments suggest that T1 changes are related to changes in the amount of protoglycan. So it's bringing slightly, slightly different information. I mean, obviously, perhaps it's being detected by the effect on the water, because that is what the MR is looking at, is looking at the hydrogen molecules within the water, uh, looking at the hydrogen, the protons within the water molecules. But it's the change in protoglycan, which is thought to then relate to the changes that you see in T1 row. 
at least in cartilage, and it's thought to also be true in disc as well. Oh, brilliant, thank you. Um, for, for, for a non-MR expert, um, that was beautifully explained, like the rest of the talk. That was a wonderful uh, uh, summary. Uh, we wish you all the best for your, your project and hope you'll come back and uh, tell us a bit more about it in the future. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. So we're, we're grateful to, to all of our speakers uh, for, for taking the time out of their, their days away from their, their patients, their students uh, and, and their research, uh, especially since unlike doing this at Birdcage Walk, we're unable to, to buy you lunch or, or dinner. Um, we have an extra um, vote of gratitude to our next speaker, uh, for whom it is very, very late in the night. Uh, so Professor Laurent Frossard is joining us uh, from, from Queensland. Um, Laura is uh, speaking uh, on, on the subject uh, relating to prosthetic limbs and bionics, which was uh, uh, an area that I selfishly wanted to work into the agenda for this, this uh, orthopedics meeting uh, for a little while, um, working a little bit in prosthetics myself. Um, so Dr. Frostard has uh, studied prosthetic limbs and bionics from a range of different directions, in considering um, uh, the prosthetic biomechanics, uh, all the way through to clinical benefits, service delivery, and health economics. So a very, very broad uh, perspective. So as our uh, as, as our international speaker, uh, we're very grateful to welcome um, uh, Professor Frossard and uh, look forward to, to your talk. So as soon as you're ready, uh, please go ahead and share your, your screen and, uh, and take it away. All right. Thank you, Alex. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Laurent Frassard. I am a bionic limb scientist working at Griffith University in Australia. And today I am going to talk about um, the way you as engineers can improve the outcome of patients using bionic limbs. Um, I, I, am, I am in Australia. It is good practice to acknowledge of doing the knowledge of country. So Griffith University acknowledges the traditional custodian on the land of which I am speaking today and pays respect to elders past and present and extends that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people. I do have very important conflict of interest. I have been doing research and consultancy work for several promoters of bionic solutions worldwide, uh, but I do not benefit directly from the provision of surgical, medical, rehabilitation or prosthetic care to individuals suffering from limb loss. Um, I'd like to start by giving a brief overview of bionic innovation for prosthetic limbs. So typically when we think of bionic solution, other than the images coming out of Hollywood, um, Terminator and so on and so forth, but for the people involved in, in with patients, when we think of bionic solution, we think of the combination of uh, regenerative peripheral nerve interface or R. RPNI, targeted muscle re-innovation, uh, TMR, or, or osseointegrated implant, or I. And, and more particularly, we think about the we are thinking about the fitting of advanced prosthetic component. And today I will be mainly focusing on osseointegration. Bone naked prosthesis are attached to the residuum through an osseointegrated implant, including a medullar part inserted into the residual bone that has either a percutaneous part, um, uh, uh, sorry, that's um, designed either as a screw type or as a press fit. And uh, with that medullar part comes a percutaneous part that connects with the prosthetic component. So the percutaneous part is literally the part that you can see if you see a patient fitted with an osseoartic rigid implant, and that's the bit that, that will be attached to the prosthetic knee or prosthetic ankle or, or elbow or wrist. Um, there are less than 10 um, implants commercially available, but only the screw type, sorry, only a screw type system is FDA approved and my very, very rough estimation of the number of cases worldwide is between 1400 and 1600. And, and it's very hard to define the actual numbers, but that's the Bob figure. Um, you know better than me what's happening in the UK. 
um, I did a bit of search and then based on my experience, I've I had the chance to work with the guys in uh, in uh, Rehampton for for very early on, actually since 2000. And, uh, and uh, uh, but clearly there's a strong momentum across the country around OCI integration. Um, this means that uh, patients um, have several options to be treated um, in the UK. And that includes uh, former service members. And indeed, uh, the military in the UK is one of the very proactive military worldwide to feed their uh, former members who have who have been injured um, during the war um, with with bionic solutions. Um, that has actually led to the publication of several key articles, um, including this one, for example. Um, if we um, look at the literature, we will also find that the early pioneers of OCI integrations and clinicians such as uh, John Sullivan, uh, Kinsley Robinson, or even uh, Dr. Soryo, Soria uh, um, have actually largely contributed to build a body of scientific literature, which is very valuable to all of us. And in fact, they've, their work have, have triggered enough interest to um, motivate the government to perform a thorough health technology assessment of bone and cut prosthesis. So when you've got a government that starts to be interested in a procedure and particularly doing health technology assessment, that's mean it starts to be really, really meaningful and, 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 and looking good in terms of promotions of the implant, provided that what they find is also uh, sufficient. But that's mean there is a strong interest in that. So le let's have a look at what these health technology assessment reports uh, have shown. Um, here is my bird eye view on the clinical outcome. Uh, I believe that engineers should know. Um, I looked at the evidence published in scientific literature um, including uh, scientific systematic reviews and sorry my slides are a bit slower than my than my talk um, and interestingly enough I found that there are about three uh, reviews focusing on efficacy for one review focusing on safety so from the get-go if you look at the literature there is a, obviously a favorable bias in in the information published so if we look at the efficacy first, there is an overwhelming evidence collected through self-reports showing that also integration increases quality of life. And in fact, it, in, it does increase by about 17%. However, this outcome must be um, considered carefully because they have three biased and uh, that are actually three co-founders of the results. The first one is the placebo effect. Uh, we tend to believe because it's an orthopedic, orthopedic surgery, there's no placebo effect. In fact, if you look at that book written by Ian Harris, who is actually an orthopedic surgeon and the former um, um, president of the Australian Orth Orthopedics Association, uh, there is plenty of examples through, throughout the book that demonstrate that every orthopedic procedure does have a placebo effect. The second bias or confounders is the Rosenthal and Pygmalion effect, when participants tend to report positive outcomes because they have been told that it works. And the more they trust the patient, the surgeon, the more they believe the surgeon is, is, the, is a very um, predominant, knowledgeable surgeon, the bigger the effect. And the final one is the um, importance of the fact that patients with osseointegration tend to be fitted with very advanced uh, prosthetic component. So we move them from a stage when they are limited prosthetic user, if any at all, with usually having a very limited um, tip type of prosthetic component, moving on to having an osseointegrated implant and a very advanced component that we call microprocessor control knees or energy storage return prosthetic fit. So part of the outcomes actually due to the fact that they are fitted with a very performing bionic knees. 
if we look at the safety that's represented by the frequency of adverse event, uh, Van Heck et al. published a, a very important literature review. And in that literature review, they have actually indicated that there are issues of loosening in 6%, periprosthetic fracture in 9%, breakage of implant parts in 31% of cases. But more importantly, they reported that deep infection occur in 41% of cases. Um, my view is that all the patients are experiencing a superficial inf infection quite regularly. So that number is more likely to be more around 100%. Um, but, and also importantly, the authors indicated that the overall risk of removal of the implant, which is the ultimate failure, well, not the ultimate failure, is reamputation at the higher level, but if we look at the removal of the implant, is up to 20% 20, 20 of cases. Now, I thought those numbers were quite high, but after after listening to the previous speaker, uh, Johan, uh, it seems like uh, we're not doing too bad compared to some of the not so good um, hip um, implant. But anyway, in all cases, 20% is, is quite not up to scratch. So that needs to be improved. Um, the results of safety are also slightly um, um, overestimated, or sorry, underestimated by three shortcomings. Um, the first one is that studies tend to report very poorly the regular intakes of antibiotics and painkillers. Um, th this is a very big problem. This is a very big problem in the long term. Uh, it's very common uh, that patients are actually taking a very um, um, a long and a long course of AV antibiotics. So in the long run, that's no good. And uh, this is also uh, partially inherent to the recall bias. Clinicians are poorly informed of the prescriptions of medication and self-medication. And finally, there is a lack of standardized way to grade and report infection. So there are two, two, the two main teams in the field have, everyone has their own way to report infection. And that seems to be more favorable uh, for them, of course. Uh, but we are desperately lacking a way to have a standardized way to report infection. Um, altogether, this means that people considering bionic bone occurred uh, solutions uh, must resolve what I call the 2020 dilemma, which is at best uh, patients <coughs> Um, have, have, have a chance to increase their quality of life by about 20%. At worst, the chance of getting the implant removed is also up to 20%. So it's actually a very difficult decision to make and it's quite daunting for, for end user to make that decision. And ultimately, after, after talking to lots of people and trying to get my head around how we can facilitate that decision, ultimately, I think in most cases, it comes down to the patient's ability uh, and their appetite to uh, tolerate uh, risk. So appetite and tolerance to risks is still the main uh, factors that determines the choice of osteointegrations integrations and bionic solutions. So we should try to do a bit better to have a more evidence-based decision rather than just personal um, preference for risks. So what's the future development of Bionic Solution? But more importantly, in the context of this talk, is what is your role as engineers and what role you can play in the development of Bionic Solutions? I didn't consult with the two previous uh, speakers, but you will see there's a lot of overlap between what they said and what I'm going to talk about. So that's, it, in, my, in some ways, it sort of indicated me that I was on the right track, but... Um, on the downside of it, it might be a bit redundant, but I'll try to make the connection with what they said before. So the first thing is um, that the first role that engineers could play a critical role is by establishing the link between efficacy and safety of bionic solutions. For example, um, we, you engineers are very good at gathering the load profile and using this information to improve the design of implant and the rehabilitation program. Unlike uh, Judith, who cannot 
um, answered very easily, being very invasive with it, with her, her sensors into the spine. One of the things that we can do with amputees is actually um, um, instrument their prosthesis. So we've got actually quite a very robust way to measure the loading. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but what, what that means really is we can actually um, engineers or the people collecting the data could actually inform the clinician and the users about the load profile that is within the Goldilocks zone during the rehabilitation and beyond. The problem of loosening possibly, and also the problem of breakage of uh, prosthetic pa component parts are essentially due to the fact that people are not applying a load that's within the safe Goldilocks zone. So they are not applying the right load at the right time. So being able to uh, provide information about this concept of Goldilocks zone loading is actually quite critical to improve safety. Um, so measuring the load is critical. I can only advise you to um, uh, read uh, this great literature review that uh, was done by Alex Chadwell and uh, and and Alex uh, Alex Dickinson, the host of the of the event. Um, this is very informative. There is a lot of information on how loading could be measured, but I'm particularly interested to looking at the way uh, we. Uh, monitor the daily activities using specific equipment. So what you can see here is actually a transducer place at the bottom of the socket. And that's actually telling us exactly the amount of forces apply, forces and moment applied on the socket. I, it, it's just a, a commercial pictures. I use it a lot for patient fitted with uh, osseointegration. integration. And, uh, but not only the very specific device we can use, but using whole body wearable devices is also a big one. Um, and uh, in the team that I'm working with at Griffith, we're looking at doing lots of smart uh, garments that can give you fitted with EMU that give us lots of information. Um, once we've got that, then it becomes a little bit easier to develop advanced neural musculoskeletal models of the limbs. And uh, that's essential to understand the interface between the implant and the bone. And uh, personally, I'm very much inspired by uh, most of the advanced model that uh, has been developed by Alex, I guess, and, and his team. And that's actually critical for us because this modeling is at the forefront of, of modeling worldwide at the moment. And there is a lot of lesson we learned from that work. Um, um, uh, particularly, we, we learn a lot from this work to develop um, a digital twin of the residuum. So digital twin is nothing else than a model that can uh, replicate all the soft tissue, well, all the tissues of the residuum, including the skin, um, uh, fat, muscle, bone, and trying to understand how using the loading measurements using some form of ultrasound um, so we we try to do differently that uh, that Judith has, has put it forward. Uh, instead of using fluoroscopy, we 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 um, we we batting on ultrasound to measure the displacement of the soft tissue within the residuum during loading conditions. Once you've got that and you've got the MRI or CT scan of the residuum, then you can start to produce models. Once you've got models, you can do. Um, uh, what um, what uh, Yan was was explaining earlier, you can do the thinking before the doing, which means you can actually plan and potentially see what's the efficacy of an intervention before you can actually have the intervention. That's the both. That's 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 the that's the big picture idea. It's the 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 implementation of that is a lot more difficult, but that's the general principle. And if on top of that. You, you you can do that in a personalized way and in real time then that's that's a big big game changer but even if we we don't go that far um once you've got the model you can actually um help to it actually helps to refine uh, in the short term anyway to facilitate the design of the medullar part the surgical procedures uh, the development of a new type of endo and or exoskeletal attachment 
and and also finally the rehabilitation program is actually very innovative work around how we can um, circulate a very low voltage current to stimulate osseointegrations, integrations for example this is one of the example but more importantly and that's going back to the point made by Johan earlier is you can personalize 3d printing of implant and also the socket because bionic solution does not necessarily um, involve doesn't doesn't necessarily have to involve osseointegrations. integrations having a very advanced socket could actually help a lot of people particularly the people with diabetes because also integration and diabetes don't go well together um, so this information can improve the design of prosthetic components such as uh, energy stirring and return prosthetic fit that would we call SR as well as macro processor control knees MPKs in conclusion what your work can do and where your work is essential is to limit what is known as the decline effect of the procedure. We are entering the phase when it's expected there will be some form of decline effect. And what that means is the decline effect correspond to the reduction of strength of evidence as the rigor of the methods increases over time. At the moment, uh, probably up to now, there is lots of paper we can get published because it's very much the flavor of the month. Editors are happy to get something that seems to be very advanced. There's a lot of reason to believe that will be it will be the future. And uh, they try to see if they can, if we can actually focus publication more on the efficacy, which is fair, that we want to know first if it works. And then it, we want to know next if it actually, if it's safe. Um, but as, as we do that, and as the procedure become more and more um, done by multiple teams, sorry, excuse me, with multiple teams, what will happen is there will be an expectation that more and more uh, research is done and, and the strength of evidence required is actually, should actually increase. We've never seen a randomized clinical trial of a conventional um, attachment versus an also integrated implant, for example. And that's what the um, decision makers in government, insurance, um, and, and other decision makers are actually after to make a strong decision uh, before reimbursing uh, the procedure. So engineering, engineers are really at, at the art of that. And, uh, and hopefully better engineering are required to improve function, <laughs> mobility, and quality of life of the growing number of individuals suffering from limb loss, considering bionic innovations worldwide. Thank you. Most of the paper that I've cited here are, are free access from um, publications. Um, you can vis visit my website, laurafossa.com, or go on, if you Google and find uh, everything is on ePrint or, or Griffiths. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for uh, another uh, excellent talk. I think the, the holistic view that you've given us of this uh, this still relatively new uh, surgical intervention was uh, was brilliant. And I think it's really important that uh, for us engineers to remember that uh, we, we're not just uh, standing beside the technology. The, the human aspect of this is so important, especially in, in in the prosthetics field where you can you can take the device off if you if you don't like it. Um, so thank you very much indeed. Um, I had a couple of questions myself. Um, uh, nothing's come come through yet from the audience, but but please do please do get typing. Um, I, I was I was especially interested where you were showing um, the, uh, the the couple of images of the the, the trans tibial uh, individual and, and connecting the the implant to, to a total knee replacement device. And, and you also mentioned the, the challenges of, of osseointegration integration with with people with diabetes. Um, I, I guess. One of the nice things about the uh, the Swedish um, early experience is they have very tight control over the the indications for for where they were using uh, these devices. What what do you think we might be seeing in the future? Uh, should we should we keep this to a very narrow group of patients? Are these being broadened out, and and, and what might be the the results of that? Yeah. Um, I mean, th there is a big push for the industry to reduce 
or to enlarge the uh, selection criteria. So you, the, at the beginning, really, ocean integration was really made for people who couldn't be fitted with any other form of conventional um, prosthesis. Um, and because it worked very well for those guys, then the the selection criteria got, got reduced a bit. Um, so now we are looking at, and it was initially mainly for transfemoral, the, the level down is now to transtibial. I'm trying to put my camera on. I thought it is on. Yeah, we can see you. All good. Okay, cool. Um, so the um, so we're trying to move it to transtibial, who couldn't be fitted any other way. But then, obviously, from a market point of view, there is only so many people, particularly in Australia, who have a transfemoral amputee who are non-prosthetic user, who have a transtibial and are not prosthetic users and don't have any diabetes. So the idea now is really there is a big push for the industry and then the marketing campaign around having a socket-free life. Um, around targeting people who are actually not particularly not badly fitted with a socket, but obviously would like to not have a socket because it's not, you know, it's decreased significantly quality of life. And that's where the tricky bit is for those people. That's where the, the 2020 dilemma is really difficult to tackle because for them, the concept, the, the concept of risks is not the same if you are easily accommodated by a socket versus if you cannot walk at all. So the perception of risk is very different. They are much more into the, the spectrum, into the middle of the spectrum. You've got the people who cannot be fitted, very indicated. You've got the people who can completely happy with a socket, K4, who, you know, could be okay. But you've got these, these people, you know, K1, K2, K3, who are borderline. So there is a big push for that. Um, there is also a big push to find ways to fit people with diabetes because that's where the big market is. Uh, and at this stage, every attempt, you, the, the classic is every every new surgeon who's involved in the process at some point will have a go by treating diabetic person. This just they need to try for themselves. And 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 at this stage, it's always ended up in a very poor outcome for the patients. Um, so where are the solutions coming coming from? Probably from you guys, from you engineers. Um, there might be a way to quote to quote the uh, percutaneous part with antibiotic films, uh, but soft tissue management like an open stoma is particularly difficult for diabetic people. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, lovely questions coming from uh, Tierney McGuire at Imperial. Um, Perhaps interesting in the, you know, the context of you know, rheumatoid arthritis, you wouldn't try and reconstruct a finger to, to the, the healthy case because it's degenerated so far. Do you think we should be aiming for users to experience the same loading profiles of healthy non-amputated limbs, or should they have their own loading profile aims with regards to the new anatomy or MSK system? Um, well, it's, it's, it's a good question. And the work we are doing at the moment, you're just following in your footsteps of, of developing a digital twin of the residuum, it's actually a precursor of the digital twin of, of a normal limb. Um, what's, what we can do with amputees is measuring the load directly, which you cannot do very easily with uh, an able, well, um, uh, a person with a full limb. Um, but certainly the way... We are hoping that the information we will gain through that type of research will translate to ocean integration at large and, and other type of joint replacement. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm trying to demonstrate my uh, my commitment to, to, to you and the audience. I, I, since, since about three o'clock yesterday afternoon, I've been frantically trying to osseo integrate my own uh, my own piece of titanium through a, a dental implantology. Um, so oh, right. it was very interesting to know, to, to, yeah, to, to listen to your talk, knowing that this is going on inside. And I think especially the, the 2020 uh, um, uh, consideration that you mentioned, certainly uh, I would have been less less keen to, to embark on that, knowing that there was a 20% yeah. uh, risk. Um, however, knowing that my, my quality of life uh, associated with a, you know, a root infection is, is, is quite different from somebody uh, yeah using a socket day to day. So yeah, it was, it was great. To, those numbers, uh, those numbers are, are really for, for lower limb dental industries. Like you, mm -hmm. you will, you will probably, uh, like a bad dentist will, will have maybe 1% of, of failure. Mm -hmm. So it's quite, if you've got a good, um, uh, bone quality from the, from the, to get go, you, you've got quite a good chance to, to succeed. So it's a very different paradigm.
Yeah. So it's, it's, it's an easy decision. Mm. And it's going to be very interesting to, to watch watch these individuals much in, into the far longer term, because I think you, you're sort of, is around about 1997 the first, um, the first interview? Um, well, the really the, the first case that was done um, in, in around 95, I think I think it's uh, Eric X, a well-known uh, patient advocate, is now just about 20 years of implantation. Uh, but but this is another this is another very important aspect is we have we don't really have a lot of information on the long term outcome you know and I think that's what I'm trying to explain to patients who ask me oh what would you do if you if you had an amputation I, I said well you need to understand what what's happening is you're just getting a piece of technology you know 20 years ago if you had a floppy drive that was the business of computing. Nowadays, it's like, well, you cannot go very far with a floppy drive. So you need, no matter when you will embark, you will never really uh, fully experience, uh, you will always be limited by the next generations of implant. Um, and that's become, and then it goes back to the concept of, of risks and to the concept of do I, it, most of the time the question is, do I need it? The question is, do I need it now? And with what I know. So, so, but yeah, because one of the, one of the limitations is we don't really know what's happening in the long term. And uh, yeah, I could elaborate on that, but I don't know if we've got, if we've got time. No, that's wonderful. Thank you, Laura. I, I think uh, I, uh, in, in the interest of, of, of sticking peacefully to time, you very kindly shared your contact details. So I think if, if any, uh, yes. any of the audience has anything to, uh, they, they'd like to ask you or to any of the other speakers, please, please feel free to contact them directly or to get in touch with, uh, with any of us, and we can uh, we can help the ace. Um, Please do. Thank you again so much for for a, a great uh, an overarching talk and uh, and for the very kind references. Um, I, I'm going to hand over to to Richard uh, Van Arkel now just to to close the event. Um, but uh, uh, thank you again all very much indeed for coming. Uh, thank you. Thanks Alex. for inviting me. And um, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, it was a really really beautiful talk. Um, to to close it off, I'd just like to finish with a note of thanks um, to everyone who's helped put this together. So obviously Alex and Diego, who've been our chairs for today's session, um, they've been driven it behind the scenes as well. Uh, Rebecca Grant and Antonio Fettini were, put a lot of effort in over summer to make this event happen as well. So thank you very much to them. And then finally, thank you very much to Emma Pateman and Francis Shaw from the IMRT, who've worked tirelessly with us it's like organising toddlers to leave the house in the morning. Uh, they've driven us to make this a possible event for you today. Uh, and finally, thank you very much uh, to the audience for being so engaged and asking so many questions. I've really enjoyed the discussions. I've really enjoyed the talks. Thank you, Johan. Thank you, Jude. And thank you, Lawrence. <laughs>